Okay, let me start with you, Marys. It was extraordinary to hear Greta Thunberg today getting involved in local Bristol politics by saying that she was delighted that the expansion of Bristol Airport had been stopped. This is after I spoke to her about the scrapping of the third runway at Heathrow Airport. You yourself were in favour of that expansion last year. Did that put you in a rather awkward position? No, because Bristol's been on the front end of, of action on climate change. The, the delivery of, of what the world needs is going to happen through cities where most of the world live in. We published this week our, our climate strategy that is an evidence-based approach. It involves replacing 96,000 house boilers, retrofitting homes, bringing mm. forward a, a low-carbon transport uh, system. And Bristol Airport, while it says it on the tin, is not actually in Bristol. It's in North Somerset, so it's not my planning decision. But you were in favour of it last year, on the record. But it's not my decision, and there's a political but game about that. you were in favour of it. Well, no, because there's a context. I'm not in favour of airport expansion, but mm. there is a question. The real aim is to get the number of people flying to reduce. And I think that's where people are missing the point. So we're in favour of reducing the number of people flying, and that's a campaign um, I'm, in, I'm in part of. And for any politician, um, Harriet, whether you know, you're a mayor or you're an MP, is it now impossible for you to ignore the voices of people like Jess who are not even old enough to vote? I do want to reassure Jess and her friends that we do really hear the message and I think it is incredibly important to act. We're the first country major economy in the world to have put into law that we want to be net zero by 2050 and we've been able to grow the economy over the last decade, uh, create millions and millions of jobs uh, while at the same time cutting carbon emissions by 25%. So we do hear uh, the message and we are acting. Right, they say they hear the message, Jess, do you trust them? I think... We need to see the action, you know, they've, <clears throat> they say that they're going to act, but really 2050 is 20, no, yeah, 2050 is 20 years too late, mm. and we want to be net zero by 2030 to avoid the catastrophic consequences of this crisis. So do you think they're not doing enough, the yes. politicians? Yeah. Okay, so what, you, you know, what would you say to them now, here, this is your opportunity? I think there are so many, you know, there's legislation that is there ready to be put in place, such as a Green New Deal, which would make the transition to a zero carbon economy so much easier and it uh, would ensure that jobs for those who currently have jobs in the mm. fossil fuel industry and really carbon intensive jobs are protected and are, you know, their voices are heard. But not everyone in the city cares as much about the environment or the future of the planet as yeah. you and your generation do. And they're saying, well, hang on a minute, we can't wait for these green jobs. That sounds great on paper, but I want the job that I was promised last month or last week. Yeah. So what do you say to them? Because there has to be a balance, doesn't there, between protecting the planet and protecting the economy? There definitely does. And I, I think the, the thing to remember is that the more time we waste, the more uh, uh, drastic this action is going to become. So if we want to, you know, stop that, you know, that uh, kind of divide, we mm. need to take action as soon as possible. Mayor Rees, do you find it annoying when people like Jess, I mean, you know, Jess, how old are you, Jess? I'm 15. Okay, when 15 year old, you know, citizens like Jess, or indeed Greta Thunberg, who's 17-year-old, are basically telling, ticking off politicians like you, giving you a telling off. No, I'll tell you what I do find a little bit frustrating. Are you sure I, you don't find that annoying? If you let me finish one sentence, okay. <laughs> is when, when we get arguments set up as though they're binary, like, like, like right now. Mm. In fact, this is really complicated. As I said, we've got a city with 12,000 people on the waiting list. We have to deliver over 30,000 homes in the context of a climate and ecological emergency. Delivering on this is challenging. We, we need to deliver a decarbonised transit system. We need a good relationship with national government. It costs billions of pounds. You've got to be, have an evidence-based plan. And that's what, that's what we're doing. So it, some things take a while. Some things can happen quickly. Right. OK. Hannah Clegg, you're a hydrologist. That means you understand how water flows, where it goes, when, whether we want it to go there or not. Are there practical solutions that you, to the flooding crisis that we're still going through at the moment that you're hearing from the politicians in charge? It's a very complicated situation. It is. I acknowledge that. But the floods that we've seen over the past couple of weeks are really an indication that we can see, you know, natural hazards affecting most of the country at any point in time. And we know that these are likely to get worse with climate change. Most types of flooding are likely to get worse. This is the new normal now that we have to get used to. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it's a tiny fraction of 1% of the problems we're storing up for ourselves unless we take some serious action soon. So, Harriet, I mean, you're coming from a constituency that has suffered severe flooding. Mm. And it's going to, it might get worse this weekend with Storm Jorge. Mm. Mm. But you also represent the ruling party. So mm. what compromises would you be prepared to make, should the mm. government make, in terms of you know, dealing with the new normal that is flooding in our country? 
Much of it is a floodplain, let's face it. Well, I look at this uh, flood event and I look back 13 years ago when we had the last really bad floods on the River Severn and we've got many, many more homes have had flood defences, so I think a compromise is we need to keep on spending money on uh, flood defences. We've also uh, been able to make the community more resilient, so individual level property protection, but also the emergency services working much more closely together. And I think that there were announcements last week, just last week, for example, where we announced that you would no longer be able to put wet wood in your wood burning stove, you would yeah. never be able to, you wouldn't be able to buy coal for your fire anymore. And so those are the kinds of action that we are taking. Are they enough, Hannah, those actions? No, they're not. Um, I think we have to do a lot more um, to make our communities resilient. I think we need to do a lot more to make sure that we are not putting people in the way of floods mm. uh, and to make the problem, it's going to get worse. So we need to really take that seriously. Mayor, you've got the particular responsibility of housing a lot of people in this city. You, I think you told me that you expect the population of Bristol, which is what, 400,000 at the moment, to go up 460,000. 460, to go up another 100,000 in, mm. you know, in the next 10 years. Where are you going to build those houses? Well, that's our challenge, and that's the nature of relationship we need to have with government. Look, one of the answers to this, with most of the world now living in cities, and cities being the big driver of emissions, is to support cities to redesign themselves. Historically, they've grown with no regard to the impact on the planet. Mm. So even if people are conscious and want to live a low-impact life, it, it's hard work. What we need is a bankable relationship with government that's worth billions of pounds over 10, 15 years for us to redesign city systems from housing to waste to water to the use of energy to transport so that even if people aren't thinking about it, they're living low-impact lives. That takes a fundamental shift in the way we run this country. Mm. OK. Jess, I mean, you know, these are practical decisions that politicians have to make. But you've got totally different concerns, haven't you? You've got your concern is about the future of the planet that you have to inhabit. Yeah, I think it's really important for politicians to realise that my generation and the generations to follow are the ones who are really going to bear the brunt of the decisions that are made now and today. So are you frustrated when you, when you look at what's going on in government, not just here but in other countries as well? I mean, the way the Greater Thunberg is, I mean, she looks at the newspapers every day and thinks, oh my God, they're just not taking this seriously. Yeah. And she gets really angry about it. I think, yeah, I think it's understandable to be... When you see all these new extremes that are becoming everyday life, it's, I don't see how you can not be angry in a way because it's affecting people and people are dying and yet the action that needs to be taken isn't currently happening. But your anger is not shared by... Well, is it shared by you? It certainly is. It's shared by you, but it's not shared by, by well, you two, well, is it? Why are you saying I'm not angry about it? Well, because you don't see, I sound angry. You don't look angry. Wait, she I'm, sounds angry. You, I'm not saying you have to be angry. You must have some <laughs> phenomenal analysis to peer okay, into I, my soul. Okay, and on a scale of one things. to ten, how angry no, are you? No, I'm angry about it because poor people get, get first and hardest by the consequences of climate change. I've been involved in development organisations for a long time. This is a, this is a major social justice issue. The people that die look like me and my dad, and that does make me angry. But being angry takes you so far. Have an evidence-based action plan and actually doing something about it takes you a lot further. Harriet, yeah, go on. I agree it's got to be about the doing, and I think it's, uh, for example, the UK, which was one of the first countries in the world to be powered by coal. We're going mm. to have given up coal altogether by 2024. Um, when I was first elected in 2010, 6% of the country's electricity came from renewables. Now it's nearly 50%. So we are taking action. Uh, I do hear what Jess is saying about she wants us to do it faster. We want to do it in a way that creates those green jobs. And yet the austerity policies that have been pursued by the government that you represented, you sat in that government, have, been, have, you know, have cut flood defences over the years. I mean, this is, there is just not enough money around to That's protect us. That's actually this not accurate. Uh, we've had six new flood defence schemes built in West Worcestershire. We've cumulatively protected over 200,000 more homes. We're increasing the flood defence budget, budget so that that's it will cover a further... That's since but before that they were cut quite severely, weren't they? they? they, they no, that's when I got all my flood defence schemes were built in that window, six of them. And so we're much, much more protected than we were, but we do, you're absolutely right, Matt, that we do have to keep on investing in flood resilience, flood defence and continuing to make sure that we are uh, working together to mitigate these and issues. And how can we afford that? The Chancellor has just put back some of the very difficult decisions of this budget because of the coronavirus. The economy is taking a bit of a hit at the moment. Who knows where this will end? Money is going to you know, run low, if not dry. How do you make sure you get the funds that you need? 
Well, I cite that uh, fact that the economy has grown 25% in the last decade, and yet we've been able to cut uh, carbon emissions by 25% during mm. that time. I think the economy's grown nearly 20%. Hannah, you've talked mm. about some of the practical things that, be, can, that can be done, but also you are, you know, you're very much, as, as I gather, you know, agree with Greta Thunberg on the importance of really tackling climate change. What is the right balance between the big picture stuff you know, and the more practical stuff that you would suggest as a hydrologist? Uh, well, I don't think that there is any conflict between everything that um, we've seen the young activists saying and all of the science and evidence that I know is uh, true about the climate changing and the action, the urgent action that we need to take to change the way that we think about our future. What is the most important, you know, the three top things that need to be done now? Um, I think that uh, people taking personal responsibility, so mobilising everybody, uh, you know, if you're a zookeeper or, you know, a, a newsreader or, or whatever, everybody has to take personal responsibility for changing the way that they live their lives. But also we do need some kind of top-down policy change that's joined up. Uh, agriculture, land management, uh, you know, everything needs to be joined up in order to, to make a difference. But where does that personal responsibility come from if people don't fear you know, the, the, this new normal, if, they, if they're not living in a flood zone, you know, if they're not living in a drought zone, if they're not experiencing this stuff, even if it's inevitable, where does that personal responsibility come from? I think it's up to us to make sure that we are communicating that actually lots of people are at risk, uh, particularly from natural hazards and floods, nearly everywhere in the country is, is at risk uh, in, in that particular sense. So if you, can, if you can generate that from that science evidence, that would be great. Jess, what would your role be in this, you know, firing people up to do more? I think it's important to remember that we are still children and we're not experts at all, but we, it's so important that the government take responsibility for this and make sure that people are educated on what's happening and know what's going on and know how it's going to affect their lives. And what are the things that you can do and you have done in Bristol to make a real difference here? Well, I, I mean, first of all, I say this isn't just about adding up individual actions. This is about systems, right? We, we, like I said, it's hard to live a low-impact life in a modern city. We need to change the whole way cities actually work, and that takes billions of pounds of investment. But just in Bristol the other day, we took order of 77 biogas buses. That means buses generated by sewage and, and, and waste food. Now, it take, it, those people getting on those buses aren't thinking, oh, I am now no longer getting on a diesel mm. bus. We have set up a means of transport that means they are not having such a negative impact on the planet. But if I can just say, there is something about yeah. poverty on this, mm. right? We need to give people the emotional and financial space to think about these longer-term existential threats as well. So actually, the consequences of austerity and welfare reform impact on our ability to maintain a democratic mandate okay. for the scale of change we need. In 15 seconds, Harriet, is is it possible for a democratic politician to get re-elected when they have to deal with these kind of compromises for the way that we live our lives? I think we've shown that you can, and I think we've been the greenest government ever. We've had clean growth over the last decade. Mm. We need to do more, and I think uh, that's what people want us to do.